Okay, good morning. Welcome everyone to this uh, rainy and windy autumn day in London. And uh, yeah, we're going to be talking about Latin America. And uh, Latin America has really been through a period of upheaval and revolution for, for over 20 years now. You, you could say that this wave or this period started back in 1998 with the, with the election of Hugo Chavez in, in Venezuela that uh, was a significant uh, event. It was not just a normal uh, election, it was a turning point in the history of uh, Latin America that opened a whole wave of uh, revolutions. But that was not a single act or something that just happened in uh, Venezuela. Obviously, the events in Venezuela in 98, you could even trace them back to 1989 when there was the Caracazo uprising, which I will say was uh, the first mass uprising of that uh, kind uh, in the period after the fall of Stalinism. This was more or less at the same uh, time, uh, fall of the Soviet Union, 1989-91. And after that, there was a general offensive campaign on the part of the ruling class to say socialism has uh, failed, socialism doesn't work. Uh, and this had a big impact on uh, workers around the world, but also on the leadership of the workers' movement, the labor movement, everywhere there was a, a marked shift to the right. And I would say that one of the main um, contributions, one of, one of the main uh, uh, features of uh, Hugo Chavez and his, his time as a president of uh, Venezuela, leader of the revolutionary movement, was that he brought socialism back onto the agenda. And he did not start from socialism, far, far from that. During his election campaign in 98, he visited Britain. He spoke, I think, at Oxford and uh, Cambridge. Uh, he met with Tony Blair, if some of you might uh, remember him. And he said at that time, uh, Hugo Chavez said that the third way sounded like a very good uh, idea. O only the third way meant one thing for, for Tony Blair and a completely different thing for Hugo Chavez. For Hugo Chavez meant something that was different from what had failed in the East, uh, Stalinism, but also something that was different from capitalism. Uh, but at that time, Hugo Chavez was not a socialist by any stretch of imagination. He didn't describe himself as, as such. He did not even, in fact, describe himself as an anti-imperialist. That, that came later. Through his own experience, he drew the conclusion uh, around 2004, 2005, that the only way forward for Latin America was socialism, that capitalism had failed to develop these uh, countries. These countries were, they are. Uh, very wealthy in mineral, uh, natural resources, uh, ecosystems, and so on. But that this country, in these countries, the majority of the population were poor. Uh, and that uh, th this was down to capitalism, and the only way forward was socialism. He said this very clearly, and then opened the way for a whole number of leaders throughout and elected presidents throughout Latin America to declare themselves socialists, even though many of them were not really socialists by any, by any definition. Uh, Chavez, you could say he was a socialist. He, he, he genuinely believed that you had to overcome capitalism and go forward. He, he didn't know exactly how to do that, and he was very confused in his, in his theoretical uh, ideas, he, but he was open to changing his uh, views, to learning, and so on. And the main thing is that he was at the head of a revolutionary movement, and he was not, for most of the time, he was not an impediment to that movement, but he was pushing the movement forward and vice versa, the movement was also pushing him uh, forward. Uh, the, the subject of this talk is not uh, Venezuela, but uh, there are many interesting things about the history of the Venezuelan Revolution. I just w wanted to give one, one anecdote. In uh, 2000 and 2002 was the coup in Venezuela in uh, April. Then in December that year, and January the following year, there was an oil lockout. Uh, the ruling class and their agents in the oil uh, industry, which was uh, at that time was already uh, state-owned, PDVSA, the main uh, state-owned oil company, they organized the sabotage of the industry. They abandoned their posts, they sabotaged operations, and they brought the, in the industry to a halt. The this was an industry that at that time was producing 3 million barrels of oil a day and came to a complete standstill really hitting the Venezuelan uh, economy in, in a very serious way. After that, 
there was a wave of occupations and workers control. The workers in the oil industry took over the installations. They made them work under workers control. And this is not some, uh, you know, some abandoned textile factory in Argentina that the workers take over. It's more or less simple to run. This is a highly developed, technologically advanced industry that is, is run mostly through computer and satellite systems. And the workers made wonders through workers control. Uh, in running and recovering production there. And then there was a meeting of workers who had been involved in, uh, in the oil industry, workers' control. Uh, workers were occupying factories in, in other parts of uh, Venezuela. And uh, this meeting was, was a meeting of worker activists, the, more radi the most radical worker activists in Venezuela, the most advanced uh, worker activists in Venezuela, there must have been two, three hundred people. And uh, Chavez was asked to give some closing remarks to this. This is the president of the country, right? So he, he went there and he spoke. And before he spoke, he said, he asked the people on the, on the table, so what are your con the conclusions of your meeting? What, what can I say? I don't know much about workers and so on. So you tell me what I'm, I'm supposed to say. And there was a big banner there that said, uh, fabrica cerrada, fabrica ocupada. So the factory that's closed should be occupied by the workers. Either the, the bosses close the factories, the workers open them and occupy them. And uh, Chavez thought that this was a very good idea, uh, caught his uh, eye, the banner, and then he spent most of his time in his, his closing <laughs> remarks uh, talking about workers' control. He said, well, look, it's, it's clear. And, and he used a Venezuelan, uh, a Venezuelan saying, if, if you don't want to, if you don't want to tend the shop, uh, we'll take it over, something like that. And, uh, and then he started, uh, so, so you can see that it was the, the movement pushed Chavez in this direction, and then Chavez amplified the call. Not only this, he then instructed the Minister of Labor to produce a list of factories that were either closed down by the bosses or paralyzed or underutilized, and, uh, and the Minister of Labor produced the list. There were 1,500 of those factories. And then in, in a televised, national televised speech, he, he produced the list and he said, look, this is 1,500 uh, companies that are closed down. The bourgeoisie is sabotaging the revolution. The workers must take over these factories and run them under workers' control, and we'll legalize it from, from the government. And, uh, and yes, this, this did happen. No, no, not, not all 1,500 work uh, factories were taken over, but many of them were taken over. And in most of the cases, the government then legalized workers' control, gave it, gave it the legal. Uh, the, then the, then the, the story goes on, the, the bureaucracy sabotaged workers' control, and there's a whole number of other things. But I'm just trying to say that uh, this was a, a revolution. This was a revolution. This was, this was a revolution in which the workers, the peasants, the poor people in the cities took the future in, in, into, in, in their own hands. And this happened not only in Venezuela. In uh, the turn of the century, 2000, year 2000, there was a revolutionary uprising in Ecuador, another country that's been in the news in the last couple of years. Uh, a massive revolutionary uprising in which, which the, uh, was led by, by the peasant indigenous organizations, but then spread to the cities. They occupied the cities. They, they created mass uh, popular assemblies. And basically, they brought the government down. Uh, then there was in 2002, I think it was, or around the same time, 2000, 2000 there was the, the so-called uh, water war in, in Cochabamba, massive uprising against the privatization of water, which was victorious, which opened the way then for the gas war in 2003, 2005, another revolutionary event. The miners, the mine workers in Bolivia, which have very revolutionary traditions, marched on the, on the capital with dynamite sticks and said to the government, unless you uh, stop the privatization of gas, the sale off of, of uh, gas will bring the government down and the, and the workers should, should rule the country. And they could have. And so, so I'm just saying it was not as is presented sometimes in uh, the bourgeois media or in academia, uh, a pink tide, they call it. Uh, a series of left-wing governments that were elected. No, 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 this was a revolutionary wave that then brought some of these people onto power as, as a byproduct of this uh, revolutionary uh, movement. Uh, now, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with this, with the experience of this left, so-called progressive governments a bit later on. But uh, it's just to give you the picture that what, what is happening now in uh, Latin America with the impact of the COVID pandemic and, and the economic recession is not just a new thing. 
it's, it's, the, it's the <clears throat> at the back end of 20 years of revolutionary upheaval and experiences. And that, and that is quite important to, to understand. Now, Latin America is probably the region in the world that's been worst affected by the COVID uh, pandemic, both from a health point of view uh, and from, from an economic point of view. The whole of the region as a whole, Latin America and the Caribbean, as it's usually uh, um, grouped together, has uh, had a collapse in GDP of something between 6.8% and 7.7%, according to different uh, figures or, or ways of measuring. This is, this is the worst ever recession in the whole continent. Worst ever. There's never been, in 150 years, 120 years, there's never been a recession like uh, this. But not only this, this recession comes after a sexenio, period of six years, from, um, if I can find the figures, from 2014 to 2019, where the average economic growth in the whole region was 0.3%, i.e. there was no growth, for six years before the pandemic struck. And, uh, and in fact, if you think about it, over here in Europe, we, we mostly talk about the 2008 financial economic capitalist crisis, but in, in uh, Latin America, 2008 was mild uh, in comparison. It, there, were, there was a dip in the economy, but it recovered quite quickly on the back of Chinese uh, thirst or hunger for natural resources, uh, oil and so on. China was not so affected by the 2008 crisis, or rather it recovered quickly and continued to import massive amount of uh, natural resources, sources of energy, raw materials and so on from Latin America. There was, there was a quick recovery. But when, when uh, the recession hit Latin America was 2014. And, and I want you to remember this date because it has a big impact, has a big significance for, for the political processes in, in Latin America, I'll, I'll discuss later on. But then from 2014, 2019, there was no economic growth. So the situation was already quite bad uh, because 0% economic growth, 0.3% is less than, than population growth. So in, 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 in effect, in practice, it's a, it's a, it's a recession. Now, as I said, uh, uh, the impact of the coronavirus on the health and, and the economy of Latin America has been the worst in the world. The region contains 8% of the world's population, but it has had almost a third of all COVID deaths. So percentage-wise, it's much higher. And this is according to official figures, which uh, clearly underestimate the real uh, situation. We see situations like in Peru, where it's been, it's been complete uh, disaster. In Ecuador, where at one point last year, uh, there were so many people were dying that uh, people were, the, the um, uh, uh, corpses were, were, were gathering outside people's uh, homes. No one could uh, pick, pick them up. Uh, and then Brazil, that you, you might have heard of, it's been, it's been in the news. The impact of the pandemic has been completely aggravated by the, by the completely irresponsible policies of uh, far-right uh, President Bolsonaro and has meant, uh, I, think, I think the official figure, 600,000 people have died in, uh, in uh, Brazil. Over one and a half million people have died in the whole uh, uh, continent, uh, according to official figures, which, as I say, underestimate. This is a massive impact, not, not only from the point of view of, of uh, people who, who have had <coughs> relatives dying and so on, but also from the point of view of the, of the economy. And, and for most of this period, Hundreds of thousands of people in uh, Latin America were faced with a stark choice of <coughs> staying at home and protecting themselves from contagion and uh, dying of hunger because they can't get any uh, income. In most of these countries, there was no uh, state subsidies for low and so on. Or, or where, they, where there were plants like this, they were very uh, small and, and insufficient. Or going out to work and, and having something to, to bring home uh, to eat and then uh, getting uh, infected with coronavirus and then dying almost uh, inevitably because, the, because of the situation of the health systems in this uh, country has been destroyed by decades of neoliberalism. Now, before I go any further, I don't like this word, neoliberalism. Uh, I use it for shorthand sometimes because everyone has, uh, understands what, but, but neoliberalism is, is really, uh, bad word, let's say it, <laughs> uh, because it kind of implies 
that there is something else that is not neoliberalism, but it's still capitalism. Many people say, oh, we're against neoliberalism. Yeah, so what are you in favor? I mean, neoliberalism is the face of capitalist policies in these countries in the period of imperialism and in the period of capitalist crisis. There's no other alternative uh, to, to these policies other than socialist revolution, uh, challenging capitalism head on. And the problem is that for many uh, academics, leaders of left-wing organizations, the problem is just neoliberalism. If we just change the policies a bit, the system remains, but we can manage things in a different uh, way, more in favor of workers and peasants. This is not the case. So that's why I, I usually don't use this word. But in any case, the health systems in these countries have been ravaged by decades of policies of privatization, cuts in uh, public spending, opening up to, uh, to foreign trade, which, uh, I mean, this is also a bad use of uh, language, isn't it? Opening up to foreign trade. No, it, what, it, what it means is opening up for imperialist exp expoliation. Uh, because there can be no equal terms of trade between Latin American countries that are, that are subject to imperialist domination and, uh, and U.S. Uh, multinationals. There's no, I mean, when, when they talk about opening up the economy, what they mean is putting up uh, the, the electricity grid, the health service, and so on, up, out for tender so that uh, big multinational companies can make profits out of uh, this. So anyway, these 20 years of these policies had ravaged the, 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 this country's economies. And uh, on top of this, then the, the COVID pandemic uh, came on top of this. And, and it's had, of course, the COVID pandemic has not had the same impact for everyone uh, as it was the case prior to the COVID pandemic. Some have benefited. Yeah, some, some people have become rich out of this uh, pandemic. The inequality of the distribution of wealth has increased during the pandemic. And you, you had situations where people were dying because of lack of access to vaccination, while uh, politicians, government officials, and so on were getting vaccinated ahead of the, were jumping the queue uh, in a completely illegal uh, manner. Or worse, you had uh, wealthy people throughout uh, Latin America traveling to Miami to get uh, vaccinated, while, while millions were dying in the, uh, getting infected and, and hundreds of thousands dying in the, in the countries of, uh, of origin, which also gives, gives you, tells you something about the character of the Latin American <coughs> capitalist class, if it can be called like that. Usually we, we sometimes use this word oligarchy, and you, you might think but it's not, not very precise, it's not very scientific, but, but it is, in my opinion it is, because it's... Uh, it's not, it's not a normal bourgeois class, it's a, it's a capitalist class, yes, because they are the owners of the means of production, but uh, they play a subordinate role to imperialism. They, they are the local office boys of uh, Angels of, of imperialism. They, they are the, the lieutenants of, of foreign multinationals, foreign interests, and their heart, if you want, is more in Miami, or in Washington than it is in uh, Rio or, or in Mexico City or in, or in Caracas. And you can see that very clearly. And uh, they, they rule these countries. It's a, it's a conglomerate of, of the owners of the land, the owners of uh, the main companies, the owners of the mass media. And they are all in conjunction with the US embassy. And it's, uh, it's an oligarchy. That's what it is. And we have people <clears throat> like, uh, and we have seen, for instance, the total number of billionaires in Latin America in 2020, Latin America and the Caribbean, increased by 31 to 107. Anyone who's quick with maths will tell you that's, uh, I don't know, a 40% increase or 30% increase in one year. The number of billionaires. This is not a relative measure, it's an absolute measure. Number of people who went over the barrier of $1 billion in uh, personal assets increased from uh, whatever it was, 70 to 107. And their combined net worth increased even more from 196 billion, uh, sorry, from 284 billion to 480 billion. The increase was 196 billion, that's over 40% increase. And that amount equals to the, equals to the GDP of a country like Ecuador middle-sized country in, in Latin, just to give you a, a comparison point. Uh, just to give you one example, there's a guy called Jorge Moll, Jorge Moll Filho from Brazil. He's a cardiologist who set up one of Brazil's biggest private hospital chains, Rededor, 
And he has seen his net worth in one year increase from 2 billion in April 2020 to 12 billion uh, a year later in April 2021. And there's a, there's a clear reason for this because uh, although Bolsonaro is the president of the ruling class in, uh, in Brazil and he has completely crazy policies in relation to COVID, criminal policies in relation to COVID, the rich, the wealthy in Brazil they were getting vaccinated, they were getting uh, treated in private hospitals run by this uh, cardiologist. I'm not sure, I'm not sure that's within the, the Hippocratic um, oath that uh, doctors take to make profits out of uh, health uh, provision, make massive profits. These profits have gone up, gone up by six times. Anyway, so this is the, this is the situation that you, you, have, uh, you have in Latin America in this, in this period. And this has had obviously a massive social uh, impact. Poverty uh, has increased massively. 34% of the people in the, in the region are now uh, under the poverty line and 13% under the, under the line of extreme uh, uh, poverty. 40 over 40% are food insecure. That means people who cannot eat uh, the, the necessary amount over, over a certain period of time, a week or, or, or a month. In Argentina, Argentina is quite a, is quite a rich country. Uh, and at one point it was even a, a, an industrialized country that, that had a GDP per capita quite high. Not, not anymore. After many years of economic uh, crisis and imperialist expo expoliation. But nevertheless, Argentina is a country that you think of as a, as a more or less developed country. 40% of the population live in poverty. 54% of uh, those under 14 live in food insecurity. And these figures have gone up massively in the past uh, two years as a result of the pandemic. But obviously building up, building on the previous conditions that existed uh, before. And in Argentina, you don't have Bolsonaro. You have a government that's nominally a progressive government, the government of uh, Fernández and Fernández. Now, before the pandemic, I, in, in, in 2019, there were already as a result of these six years of no economic growth, the accumulation of contradictions, there were already revolutionary uprisings. Why do I say revolutionary uprisings? Because, because they were revolutionary uprisings. This was not a case, say, in Ecuador in October, two years ago, October 2019. In Chile, around the same time, October, November, December 2019. These were not just protest demonstrations in which people marched from A to B and demand the end of one particular law. This was a challenge to the whole system. Not, not only to the whole capitalist system, but also the system of bourgeois democracy, being completely discredited by corruption scandals. Incidentally, now we're talking about wealth accumulation in, in Latin America. You know, uh, uh, these this recent uh, revelations with the Pandora Papers, 90 out of the 300 people named in the Pandora Papers are politicians and public officials in Latin America, including three serving presidents, uh, including, uh, I don't know who, exactly who they are, but there's a president of Chile, Piñera, the president of uh, Ecuador, uh, uh, Lasso, and another one, can't remember, the fi a finance minister and a central bank gover governor. So anyway, um, uh, corruption scandals and, and the, the lack of legitimacy of bourgeois institutions. Normally, the ruling class does not rule through brute force, i.e. people are not forced to go to work every day by armed men at the, at, the, at the doorstep or anything like this. They're not kept in the factories by armed guards. People go along with a daily capitalist exploitation because they think it's normal or they think there's no alternative or, or they think that there's, at least there's democracy, you can vote one set of, uh, of uh, politicians or another. But in this case, this whole system of, of voting one set of politicians or another has been completely discredited because people realize that whoever you vote, they'll, they'll carry out the same policies and, and they're all corrupt and, uh, and, uh, and they are. So this was a question of the whole regime. In Chile, they said it's not 20 pesos, it's 20 years, M meaning, meaning uh, it's not the 20 pesos that was the, 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 the fair increase in the, in the subway fares in, in Santiago that sparked the protest. It's 20 years of this kind of policies, privatizations and so on, 30 years more, more like, since, since the fall of the Pinochet uh, dictatorship. Now, 
I can give you all the details, I can't go into all the, the details of those uprisings, but these were certainly revolutionary uprisings. Like in, in Ecuador, uh, two years from, from today, almost from this weekend, the, the government had been forced to flee the capital, Quito, and the, and the Carondelet uh, presidential palace. The, the government had been forced to flee to, uh, to Guayaquil, the, the center of the oligarchy, uh, surrounded by masses of uh, protesters, workers, peasants, indigenous uh, people, the youth. They were clashing with the police on a daily basis. They had declared a state of emergency. The, 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 they, they had brought the, the army on the streets. They couldn't stop the movement. And then the people took over the National Assembly. They set up a People's Assembly and they basically said they were going to take power. Uh, so this is a revolution. This is an, an insurrectionary uprising. In Chile, it was similar. Uh, the, the government brought the, the, the army on the streets, the carabineros. Uh, hundreds of people were injured, dozens were killed by police repression. This didn't stop the people. There was, there was two general strikes, one on the 25th of, uh, 23rd of November, I think, another one earlier on the 12th of uh, November. There was a demonstration two years from today, which was the largest demonstration in Chilean uh, history, over a million people in the capital. This is a, a relatively small country in terms of population, a million people or more in the, in the capital. Uh, what did they want? To clear the decks, everyone should go. We, we must remove all of the, all of the system. Uh, and they set up uh, popular assemblies, cabildos abiertos and, and so on. And they were, they were starting the process of, uh, of uh, masses ruling their own uh, destinies. Now these two insurrections, which were the most advanced of a series of other insurrections that took place in Puerto Rico in the summer of, uh, of 2019, in Haiti for over two years of mass protests and, and, and demonstrations, and so on, were defeated, or rather, they were derailed. Because I, I will argue that uh, the, the Chilean insurrection, for instance, has not been defeated. It's, it's been derailed and it's been, been thrown back temporarily. But, but the last week, on the first anniversary of the on the second anniversary of the insurrection, there was a mass demonstration in uh, Santiago. Again, people clashing with the police and so on um, for the lack of leadership. For the lack of leadership, the, the workers could have taken power in Ecuador very clearly and in Chile very likely, but there was no leadership that was uh, raising that uh, idea. Or rather, the leadership that the movement had, or had it from the previous uh, period, uh, reached a deal with the existing uh, power forces and, and diffused the, the whole movement. And then on top of that, then the, the pandemic struck in April 2020. And uh, obviously with the pandemic came lockdowns, and so on, and it was um, more difficult, or almost impossible, to maintain this level of mobilization in the streets. Plus, uh, you can't be on the streets all the time, unless you have a perspective of where the movement is going. Finally, uh, maybe not disillusionment, but, but tiredness sets in. People are prepared to make great sacrifices. They did make great sacrifices, but uh, they will only remain on the streets fighting if they can see there's a perspective that we're going somewhere, that, that, that someone knows where we're going, and, and, and this, is, this, is, uh, this is the way forward. But they have not been defeated, and they have not been crushed by, by repression or anything like that. And so these movements will re-emerge. They are, in fact, re-emerging as we speak. Uh, this last week, there was a two-day general strike in uh, Ecuador against the Lasso government with road blockades, mass demonstrations, workers and peasants fighting together against this right-wing uh, government. In Chile, as I said, there were the big demonstrations. But even during the lockdown, there were mass movements. Uh, during the pandemic, let's, let's put it this way, there were mass movements in Guatemala. People assaulted uh, the parliament, set the building on fire to prevent uh, uh, privatization law from being uh, passed and the budget from being passed in Peru where there was a parliamentary trickery, and the masses came out on the streets to say, we don't want any of, any of those. And they were on the streets for a week. There were three presidents in a, in a week. They, they, they couldn't uh, re recover legitimacy. In Colombia, now in Colombia, I don't know how much you know about Colombia, but Colombia is the country in Latin America that is under the, the, most, domina the most tight domination by imperialism, and with a really vicious ruling class. 
In Colombia, there's, there's been a, a, a so-called bourgeois democracy for a very long time, but it's a bourgeois democracy that, is, that, is, uh, that relies on uh, fascist paramilitary gangs organized by the state and the cattle ranch uh, owners, uh, which are linked to narco-trafficking that basically will uh, kill anyone who threatens their power at a local, regional or national level. Uh, as, as I'm telling you, this is not an exaggeration. There was, a, there was a political party, the Popular Unity, about 20 years ago or so, that they, they abandoned <clears throat> the guerrilla struggle, they went into political struggle, they made a deal, and all of their leaders were killed. Presidential candidate, their MP candidates, their local candidates, everyone. Uh, the, the, since the peace agreement, which was when two, three, three years ago, three, four years ago, uh, hundreds of people have been killed by paramilitary uh, gangs. And these paramilitary gangs, they, not op they don't operate outside the law. They, they are illegal, but they operate under the cover of the, of the state, of the bourgeois state, and, uh, and the government. The government of Uribe, the government of Santos, the government of uh, Duque. So, what happened in Colombia this year is really extraordinary. This is the, the last country where you will think there will be a movement like that. And there was a movement. There was already a movement in 2020. Movement against police brutality, when, when police killed a young uh, worker in a working class neighborhood in Colombia. There was, a, there was an uprising of protests and people burned down, I think, 36 um, neighborhood police stations. Uh, that, that was in the middle of the, of the pandemic. And this movement this year, a three month long national stoppage took place in the middle of the pandemic. In fact, in fact the pandemic was going up. The, the number of cases were going up and people were out in the streets with signs saying, when people, are, when people are more fearful of the government than of the pandemic, then that's why we are on the, we are on the streets. We don't care if we die for, about the pandemic because we die, we're being killed anyway. Uh, and people came out on the streets against, against the attempt of the Duque government, government of, uh, of Colombia, to introduce a law series of a package of uh, tax reforms that will uh, unload the burden of the public spending during the pandemic on the poor, i.e. through VAT taxation of, of all sorts of things. For instance, they, were, they wanted to tax, uh, they want to put VAT on tap water in your homes, but not on bottled water. Uh, so that's quite clear who's, who's going to hit uh, the most. And people came out on the streets, and they came out on the streets despite repression, despite uh, state of emergency, despite the fact that the government sent the army, not, not the police or, or the, the, the police, the riot police in Colombia is, is quite rightly feared, they're smart, but then, uh, which is semi-military uh, riot police force, but uh, they sent the army to, to places like Cali, for instance, which was one of the, the strongholds of the, of the movement. And the movement continued for three months. The most interesting thing I will say about this movement, it reveals not only that people have had enough and they prepared to fight even against a government like that with a, with a means at their disposal, but also it reveals the, 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 the complete bankruptcy of the trade union and left-wing leadership in Colombia and everywhere else. You know what happened in, in uh, I can't remember the exact date, I think it must have been the 26th of April or something like this, was when, when this movement started. So the, all the trade union, the trade union confederations, the, the, the teachers unions, and all, all of the teachers, all of the trade, main trade unions called for this day of action against the tax reform. And they called it a national stoppage. But they didn't mean a, exactly a national strike, but a day of mass protest and so on, road blockades. And then, um, and then people came out on the streets, and this was just before May Day, just before the, uh, this was on the 28th of April, sorry. Uh, this was just before May Day, which, which this year fell on a Saturday, if I'm not wrong. And then, and then people said, okay, we are out on the 28th, we're gonna continue to be out throughout the week until May Day, and, and we're gonna escalate this movement. And the trade union leaders, after the first day, they said, no, 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 we're calling the whole movement off, because of the pandemic, it's very, very dangerous to be on the streets. And so on May Day, we're gonna have uh, online uh, protest uh, rallies. And people completely ignored the, the trade union leadership and they remained on the streets for three months without uh, any leadership. 
Uh, imagine that, that, that just gives you, uh, and the situation is very similar throughout uh, uh, Latin America. In Chile, exactly the same, uh, exactly the same. There was no leadership, or rather the leadership that there was, was behind the events, uh, uh, pu pulling the masses back, trying to prevent the, the movement from escalating and, and, and giving no direction. So this is really very, very important movement and also destroy this idea that was so popular maybe five years ago, six years ago, of a conservative wave. They said there's a conservative wave in, in Latin America. And, uh, and this idea was very prevalent, not only in bourgeois circles, but also in progressive circles. I have to say, um, don't like to have a dig at, at other organizations, but, it, but, but two years ago we were having a meeting so this same meeting, we had a big meeting about the Latin American Revolution. This was in the, in the middle of the Chilean and uh, Ecuadorian events. And uh, the SWP were having a meeting in uh, SOAS nearby. And the title of the meeting was, uh, was The End of the Pink Wave in Latin America. Uh, c completely uh, taking in all the bourgeois propaganda about what was going on. Unfortunately for them, this was a meeting they organized back in, in August 2019. By the time the meeting was taking place, uh, the masses were in the streets challenging uh, for power in Ecuador, in Chile, and the title of the meeting had nothing to do with, uh, with what was happening in reality. But there was no such conservative way. However, it is true that around 2014, 15, 16, a whole number of these progressive governments fell or were removed from power in elections. In, uh, in um, December 2015, the Kirchner uh, government lost the election in uh, Argentina. In uh, same year, same month, same year, the Venezuelan PSUV lost the National Assembly elections. Later on, you, s you saw the election of Bolsonaro in Brazil, 2018. But prior to that, there had been big movements in 2013. <laughs> 2015, the election, very narrow election of uh, Dilma Rousseff in Brazil, and a whole number of things like this, the, the, the betrayal of the Ecuadorian government of uh, Lenin Moreno, who had been elected on a progressive ticket and then became a right-wing uh, government, handed over Assange to, uh, to the Brits in this uh, country. Um, and so how do you explain that? If, if you say that's not a conservative way, what, what, what is it? Uh, and my argument is that, our argument is that th this was not the masses shifting to the right. In most cases, these governments were defeated by abstention. I, it's not people who voted for progressive tickets before were now voting for right-wing uh, governments, but mainly they were abstain abstaining, they were demoralized and so on. There was perhaps one exception to this, which is uh, Brazil, but we can, we can go into that in, into more, more detail. But, but in general, this was the case. And why was this happening at this time? Remember what I said before, 2014, the beginning of the crisis in, in Latin America. Raw, prices of raw materials collapsed. For instance, the price of uh, oil went from 100, 120 at its peak uh, bar, uh, um, dollars per barrel of oil at, at its peak to down to 20, 30, 40, massive uh, collapse. This had an impact on the ability of many of these so-called progressive governments to implement social programs and social measures without challenging capitalism. Because, of, uh, of, uh, because all these governments stayed in power for, for more or less the same time, 2000 to 2015, 2005 to 2015, you can see it in, in Ecuador, in, uh, in uh, Brazil, in Argentina, in a whole number of countries, it more or less coincides in the same uh, period of time. And the reason is clear. There was, there was a, a short but important period of high prices of uh, raw materials, and this allowed these governments to navigate, certain room of maneuver to navigate this contradiction of implementing social programs, of which there were many, education, healthcare, and so on, without challenging the ownership of the means of production, without challenging capitalism. This is what these governments did. And in most cases, in Bolivia, in Ecuador, in Argentina, the, the role that these governments played was to re-legitimize the mechanisms of bourgeois democracy, which had been extremely damaged by these revolutionary upheavals at the beginning of the, of the century. 
Uh, and this was the case, for instance, in, in Bolivia. For instance, in, in Bolivia, there have been two revolutionary waves, or three, 2000, uh, 2000, 2003, 2005. The worker school have taken power, but they did not. And then someone who had not been involved in any of these movements, Evo Morales, in fact, Evo Morales was in, in Europe during the October 2003 uh, uprising, was traveling around Europe and giving lectures. And then he was elected as president with a massive uh, majority, 55, 60% at one, at one point he had. Uh, and he was able, uh, he was able to, um, to carry out some, some uh, social programs on the basis of this, making compromises with the ruling class, at the same time making concessions to the, to the workers and, and peasants because of this exceptional period of high prices of, of raw materials and the pull of the Chinese uh, uh, economy, which has now become the main trading partner of the whole of South America in countries like Argentina, Brazil, Peru, Ecuador, Chile, Venezuela. And, and what, what's the relationship? These countries export uh, raw materials, uh, grains, soybeans, meat, uh, copper, tin, uh, gas, lithium, oil and so on uh, and that's it and, 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 and the Chinese invest in infrastructure works through debt through loans this is classic imperialism if you if you want to if you want to look it up in uh, in Lenin's uh, book on, on imperialism this is the relationship but this relationship has finished now now the relationship continues but but this period of high prices of raw materials has finished uh, the raw materials collapsed created a period of five, six years of uh, economic stagnation or, or recession. And this, this was before co the COVID pandemic. The COVID pandemic has come to aggravate all of these uh, processes. And once it's over, if it's over because the, the, the levels of vaccination in most Latin American countries, with few exceptions, are very low. Uh, so, so the impact of pandemic will continue <coughs> affecting the economy. But once that is over, the, the, the pre previous situation will be reestablished and that will not be necessarily a good thing and it will not be in my opinion the conditions for re-establishing the legitimacy of the bourgeois democratic system in latin america no not at all uh, in fact what you've seen since is is precisely the opposite for instance you've seen the election in peru where pedro castillo won the election pedro castillo was complete unknown before this election he stood for a party there's not his actual party but he stood for a party peru libre Free Peru, party that uh, had never occupied any national uh, office, and there was polling very low in the opinion polls. Why was he elected? Because he was the most outsider uh, candidate in that election. People voted uh, for the candidate that was against everyone uh, on the left. Now, some, some of his uh, political platform is actually reactionary on, on questions like uh, <clears throat> same sex marriage. Uh, women's rights, abortion rights, and so on. It's completely reactionary. Uh, some people call it conservative. It's a reactionary platform. However, that's not the main reason why people voted for him. The main reason that people voted for him is because of his slogan is, is summarized in his main election slogan. No more, f no more poor people in a rich country. Mm, Peru is an extremely rich country, has uh, a lot of mineral resources being exploited by US, Chinese, Canadian uh, multinationals. Meanwhile, the majority of the people are poor. And this is the contradiction that exists in all Latin American uh, countries and that he uh, crystallized in this slogan. And he basically said, we're gonna listen to this very carefully because uh, this his electoral program has been completely misinterpreted and misrepresented by the bourgeois media around the world. His program, I, I've read it, it's, in, it's in, in the website, there's a PDF, you can download it. It says, it doesn't say we're against capitalism. Uh, it says we're against neoliberal capitalism and we are in favor of uh, a popular economy with markets, whatever that means. But specifically about the mining resources, mineral resources, he says, we're going to renegotiate these contracts with these multinationals to make it much more favorable to uh, Peru. And we think there's room for that because these multinationals are making multi-billion uh, profits. And we're, gonna, and we're going to... And if they don't want to renegotiate these contracts, then we're going to nationalize them. This is what he said. He didn't say we're going to nationalize them. He said, first, we're going to 
So you can see that his program is not particularly radical. Uh, it's not a socialist program, certainly, even though the, his party, Peru Libre, describes it, him, itself as a Marxist, Leninist, and Mariateguist party. Mariategui is the founder of the, of the Peruvian Communist Party, or the Peruvian Socialist Party, and the Peruvian trade unions, the 1920s and, and uh, 30s, early, early 30s. And um, so that's how they describe themselves, but they're not. In fact, the, the program is a strange mix of a national popular program and a Stalinist two-stage theory. And um, yeah, I'm, I might need five minutes more okay. or something like this. Um, but I want to concentrate on this question of Peru because I think it's, it's quite, um, it reveals a lot about the, the situation in other countries as well because the program of many of these other people are very similar. It's a program that says neoliberalism is bad and there is a different way of running capitalism uh, making deals with the multinationals so that we can benefit the majority of the population. However, the problem is that this cannot work. And the very experience of the first three months of the Pedro Castillo government revealed this very clearly. First of all, he watered down his program in the second round of the presidential election. He was no longer saying we're going to nationalize this. He was just only saying we're going to renegotiate the contracts. The second part of the clause was, was dropped. He, he brought in a minister of finance in waiting. He wasn't president yet, but he was this, this guy who was going to be the minister of finance, Franke, Pedro Franke, who's a World Bank economist and, and a member of the, of the left academic left, and he watered down the program. He issued a statement that said, we're gonna, not going to nationalize anything, we're not going to uh, bring anything into state uh, ownership, and we are not, uh, have nothing to do with Chavez or the Venezuelan uh, revolution. Calm down, we're going to work with big business and so on. Uh, but obviously, big business didn't vote for this government. The people who voted for this government were workers and peasants who wanted radical change. They voted for this government because they wanted nationalization. So this is the contradiction of the Pedro Castillo government. I mean, we've seen it. Uh, first of all, the bourgeois media started attacking his Minister of Foreign Affairs, Bejar, who had been a guerrilla in the 1960s and a member of the Alvarado uh, revolutionary government in the 1970s, late 60s, uh, until they got him out. He was sacked from, from the government as a gesture towards uh, big business. Then they started attacking the president, uh, sorry, the prime minister, the, the, the president of the Council of Ministers, Bellido, who was a radical and he'd been talking about nationalizing gas and this and that. And, uh, and then uh, Pedro Castillo made a trip to the United States, met with the American uh, Peruvian Chamber of Commerce, and he met with uh, Biden and all that. And then he was convinced that we have to work with big business. And, and then he sacked his government because it was too radical and he put more moderate people in. But still, the, the bourgeois are not happy with this uh, government. It's not their government. They don't trust uh, this guy who has been elected by the workers and peasants to carry out one policy. They don't trust him at all. And they're going to continue this campaign against, now, now they have a campaign against Minister of Justice, too radical, is involved in corruption or whatever, is a terrorist. Uh, and, and this is the contradiction that you find yourselves in 10 years ago, it might have been possible to carry out some sort of negotiation with the multinationals, maybe get a bit more money, uh, but fundamentally this policy cannot, uh, cannot work. It's the same, it's the equivalent to the policy that says we're going to tax the rich and we're going to make them pay tax instead of, of, of uh, siphoning it off to, to tax havens. Uh, i.e. the policy of reformists in this country, of, of Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell. And this policy cannot work because fundamentally the capitalists are not there to subsidize health care and education, they are there to make profit. Uh, it doesn't really matter whether they are, they are nice people or, or, or not nice people. And some, some capitalists might be nice personally, although the position they occupy in society tends to make them uh, psychopaths, but uh, there's a study that shows this, that psychopaths, uh, psychopathic personalities, I, I'm not a psychologist or anything like this, but psychopathic personalities are people who, who don't care about nobody else, they only care about themselves, are more prone to become managers and direct the CEOs of companies. Yeah. It fits. But anyway, it's not about whether they're nice or not. If, let's say, a capitalist decides to, yes, I'm going to pay more tax, 
uh, and so on, then he's going to be out of business because his, his, compet his main competitor is going to do the opposite and he's going to sell his products cheaper, he's going to, he's going to, he's going to <coughs> put him out of business. But in Latin America this is even more the case. Uh, there's even less room for any uh, maneuver, particularly at the time of capitalist uh, crisis. So I think that this is very important to understand. The main lesson from the progressive governments is that they made too many concessions, they made too many compromises with the ruling class, with the oligarchy, with the capitalists, and, uh, and they carried out a program uh, which could be implemented for a certain period of time, but when, when it came to the crisis in 2014, they were left with nothing to offer. They de demoralized and disillusionized, if that's a word, their own uh, base of support, and they lost the elections. They were removed from power through election. Because even in Brazil, you can say that Dilma Rousseff was removed through parliamentary maneuver. And that is true. But at that point, her approval rating was already down to 10%. So, uh, I mean, the, the parliamentary maneuver could only take place because there was no one prepared to come out on the streets to defend that, uh, that government. Incidentally, the parliamentary maneuver was, was led by Temer, who had been a minister in, uh, in Dilma's uh, government. So if you ally yourself with the ruling class, either inside your government or through deals outside, then you're gonna, they, they're not trusting you. They're going to organize a coup against you all the same. Who organized the coup in uh, Bolivia against Evo Morales? The oligarchy in Santa Cruz. What was the opening rally of that election campaign was in Santa Cruz and Evo Morales stood there with the main representatives of the, of the oligarchy saying we can work together, make Bolivia great and, uh, and all of this. So, so you, make a deal with a, with a, you attempt to make a deal with the ruling class, the ruling class at the, the moment they think you're no longer useful to them, they will stab you in the back and they will remove you from power because you're not a representative of of uh, them. This is the problem with all these reformists. And so I'll finish, with, uh, I'll finish with this. There is no room for compromises in Latin America as there might have been for a short period of time in, in the mid-2010s. And so therefore the stage is set for class struggle. But the problem remains that there is no leadership and there's no clear program of where to go. It's extraordinary that the masses have fought so uh, courageously against all odds, against their own leadership in places like Peru, Ecuador, and they're still on the, on the streets these days in Chile, in, in Ecuador and so on. But they need a, a program. What is this program? This program, in my opinion, is the program of uh, a program that already exists in, in Latin America, the program of uh, Jose Carlos Mariategui, founder of the Communist Party in, in Peru, the program of, uh, the program of Julio Antonio Mella, founder of the Communist Party in, uh, in Cuba. The program of the Communist International had at that time, in the 1920s, the program that Trotsky put forward for, for Latin America in the 1940s. And what is this program? It says, Mariategui says in, in uh, 1928 in an in a editorial for his magazine called Anniversary and Balance, and he says, in this America of small revolutions, the same word revolution frequently lends itself to misunderstanding. We have to reclaim it rigorously and intransigently. We have to restore its strict and exact meaning. The Latin American Revolution will be nothing more and nothing less than a stage, a stage in the world revolution. It will simply and clearly be the socialist revolution. Now this is important because Mariategui is usually misused by all sorts of academics and reformists to say, oh no, Mariatic is said that uh, the revolution in Latin America must be unique and special. And he did not say that. This is what he said. This is what he said very clearly. Uh, he said, we cannot copy all the revolutions. <coughs> but he didn't say the revolution must not be socialist. He said this very clearly. He said, to this, add all the adjectives that you want to this word, revolution, socialist revolution, according to the particular case, anti-imperialist, agrarian, national, revolutionary. Socialism supposes, precedes and includes all of them. So there's no separate revolution other than the socialist revolution. And the socialist revolution in Latin America is only part of the world revolution. It's quite clear. This is the program of permanent revolution. It's the program of the communist international. And, and, uh, and Mariategui certainly was not a Trotskyist. And he was a bit confused about this, this question. But nevertheless, he was a communist. 
a Marxist and he stood by, by the program that the Communist International had given itself in the 1920s and, uh, and uh, Lenin. Julio Antonio Mella, the founder of the Communist Party in Cuba, was killed very young, 1929. He says, in order to say that Marxism is exotic in, uh, in America, i.e. it's foreign or not applicable, you will have to demonstrate that there is no proletariat here, that there is no imperialism with the characteristics described by Marxists before, <coughs> that the productive forces in America are different from, from those in Asia and Europe. But America is not a continent of Jupiter, but of planet Earth. <laughs> I think it's quite clear as well. The, uh, people say, oh no, Marxism is Eurocentric. Marxism doesn't apply to Latin America. The, the class composition in Latin America is different. Well, of course, the class composition in Latin America is different than uh, in Britain. Britain is an imperialist country. Latin America is a, is a series of countries dominated by imperialism, in which, say, the peasantry in some, in some uh, places plays a bigger role. The urban poor represent a bigger section of the population in, in many of these countries. But the role of the proletariat is the same. And in any case, the, the specific role of proletariat in society in every single one of the Latin American countries, even the most backward of them, is bigger than it was in Russia in 1917. It's bigger. These countries are more capitalist than uh, for good or for bad, a more capitalist in the sense that they are capitalist countries dominated by imperialism, than uh, Russia was in 1917. And which class led the revolution in, uh, in the Soviet Union, in, in Russia in 1917? The working class. And finally, I'll just quote, I'll finish with this quote. In, uh, from Trotsky, in, in the, the, pro, the, the War and the International, a manifesto of the Fourth International in 1940, he wrote, South and Central America will be able to tear themselves out of backwardness and enslavement only by uniting all their states into one powerful federation. This is another important point. Latin America has been independent for 200 years. Peru is celebrating its, uh, its 200 years of independence now. Venezuela was a bit earlier. Uh, but then it was divided in 20-something, 20 29, 30 different republics, each one ruled by their own uh, little oligarchy subject to imperialism. The, the, the dream of uh, Bolivar, the liberator, was uh, the unity of Latin America. He, he participated in the liberation of seven or eight of the, of the Latin American countries. And, and Trotsky says, the, the South and Central America will only be able to tear themselves out of backwardness and enslavement by uniting all their states into one powerful federation. However, this is not exactly the same that Bolivar said 200 years ago. There, there's an additional clause, and this additional clause is the following. But it is not the belated South American bourgeoisie, a thoroughly banal agency of foreign imperialism, who will be called upon to solve this task but the young South American proletariat, the chosen leader of the oppressed masses. The slogan in the struggle against violence and intrigues of world imperialism and against the bloody work of native comprador cliques is therefore the Soviet United States of South and Central America. So <laughs> South and Central America in, in Latin America will only be free and united on the basis of a socialist uh, revolution. And there's no other revolution that is pending. Yes, in some countries there are national and democratic tasks to be carried out. The agrarian reform, national independence, uh, the, the respect for the national uh, minorities and so on. But this can only be fully resolved as part of a struggle against capitalism and against uh, imperialism. And that can only be a struggle for socialism.